Can I, um, tech team, can you get ready to give me a countdown clock? Because uh, I have the everlasting message, but it doesn't have to be an eternal word, right? Like it, it's the eternal word, doesn't have to be an everlasting message. So I'm going to try to keep it condensed since uh, Paola keeps preaching my message tonight. <clears throat> that was good worship, amen? Nah, you're good. That was good, amen? I'm here to tell you tonight I love Jesus. Mike Randler, if you're watching, we love you. We declare healing over your life in the name of Jesus. I spoke with him today. He's walking around the house. And uh, I said, well, why don't you help us come move Kellyanne and Travis? I don't understand. Could have done some physical therapy moving boxes. I don't get it. I just want to publicly forgive Travis and Kellyanne for not inviting more people to help with the move. I'm used to it at this point. They never invite enough people. Next time, I'm going to invite them myself. Corey and I, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you've got a Bible, you can uh, turn to Luke chapter 17. I'm going to talk more than I'm going to preach. Oh, they already started my countdown. Oh, goodness gracious. That 58 seconds didn't count. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <clears throat> wow. God is doing something very exciting in our, in our um, midst right now. I'm not a hype guy, but I get hyped about Jesus, Amen. right? But um, I don't want to... There's a, there's a big difference between hype and prophecy. One starts in the human soul. The other one starts in the spirit of God. And if you have to create something by hype, then you have to keep it going, and I don't have that kind of energy. If I was a younger man, maybe. But uh, I want God to carry it all. Amen? Are you with me? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Paolo's doing an amazing job. Are you ready for tomorrow? It's going to be good. Four of you are ready. You're going to get something tomorrow. Luke chapter 17, are you there? I, uh, I, I, this message is kind of burning on my heart. It's more of a, like I said, a talk than a message, but uh, I feel like it's going to encourage some people. It may offend a few of us. We're going to start in uh, chapter 11, excuse me, Luke chapter 17, verse 11. I'll read the scripture, then I'll talk. It says, now while he, that being Jesus, while he was, wow, woof, mm, ha, okay, ah, ha. Ha, mm. ha, 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 wow, okay, here we go. Ha, I'm pick this up off the ground before I accidentally step on it. Ha, mm. shaba, mm. here we go, ready? Mm. Ha, ha, hmm, hmm, mm. ah, ah. Shaba, pay attention, honey. Pay attention. Mm, there we go. Hallelujah. Mm. Ah, how you doing, Cecilia? Ha. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You coming back? Yes. Okay, good. Hallelujah. You ready? Luke chapter seven. How you doing, Duke? Yeah? Hallelujah. Would you let me know when your feet start burning? Ha. 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 Okay, here we go. Here we go. Ready? Wow. Ha. I need when if your if your feet start burning, I just need you to wave to me. I just need to know who the, that's you. Okay, that's a good word. Excellent. You can put your hand down. This is good because <clears throat> the Lord's got a word for a couple people, and He's going to confirm it with burning feet. I just and don't lean into, don't make it up. You don't want to call this not yours. There's a lot of evangelists who the Lord uses prophetically, and so they call themselves prophets. And then all of a sudden, their evangelistic ministry gets less fruitful. Because they've tried, to, they don't honor the grace that's on their life. They want somebody else's grace. And so they start calling themselves prophets, and they stop winning souls, and they're not really a prophet. It's a recipe for frustration. As if a prophet is better than an evangelist. As if a man is better than a woman. As if any call is better than your call. You know what the greatest call in the world is? Your call. Your call is the greatest call in the world. Aha. Uh -huh.
I have the greatest call in the world for me. Is the fire washing over you yet or what? I'm just, is it washing over you? So no one else's feet has started yet, huh? Well, I just, the Lord told me he's going to start, you know, well, I know this. He's calling some people to preach. He's confirming it with burning feet. <clears throat> How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel. All right, here we go. Luke 17, 11. Those, those, those minutes didn't count. While he, was on, <clears throat> while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a, at a distance met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, ha. This is a very good night to be here. He's assigning angels. This is a very good night to be here. Did you see it, Lillian? Did you see it? That was wild. As they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered... And said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, here it is or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. You say amen to the reading of the word. Amen. amen. That's a lot longer passage than I would normally read on a Sunday morning, but it's not Sunday morning. And we did a lot longer worship than we normally do because, again, it's not Sunday morning. I want to do something. I have a very brief message, but it's, I feel like it's somewhat worthwhile. <clears throat> we are people of the story. I need you to hear this. We Christians are people of the story. And what I want you to come away from tonight with is that you need to trust the story. Okay, what does this mean? Many Christians have what some of us call, put this up, Josh, versitis. They have a condition called versitis. They know the chapter and verse, but they don't know the story. They got the verses memorized out of context, but don't understand the story that it comes from. Let's, 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 do, um, let's do an exercise. Let's do an exercise. Who here knows John 3.16? Has anybody heard John 3? Let's all say John 3.16 together if you actually know it. Let's say it together. Don't put it up there, Mr. Uh, Mr., Mr. I don't even think you have it back there, tech guy. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world. Right, that he gave his only begotten son, whoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We know this, right? Well, let's start with 14. Let's just start with John 3, 14, shall we? Let's, oh, no, no, let's just say John 3, 17. Let's start with John 3, 17. Ready? 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 For God did not send the son into the world. To, we do not as many people know that, though, right? Let me read you starting in verse 14. Here's the story. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. And so the story, as Jesus is telling it, is different than the story that the world understands about God, and it's different than what many Christians believe about God. There's actually a story, not of God wanting to contemn the world, but God wanting to save the world from its own sin. Now, Jesus told the story that the 
kingdom of heaven is like a man who owned a vineyard and kept sending his servants to get the vineyard in order and they kept beating the servants and finally he said, I'll send my son, but they murdered the son. Jesus is saying that people got the story wrong historically and they kept destroying the messengers and finally he sent his son to set the true story. Now, if that is true, if we actually can believe the words of Jesus, and I believe we can, then that means that much of our interpretation of what God was doing throughout history was wrong. That's scary to some people. Because they say, if we got the story wrong, then, then how do we know what God is really doing? Well, we know what God is really doing because we know God. That's the story, that He actually wanted to save us and that He would live inside us by His Spirit. Let me tell you, we're people of the story. We can trust the story. Let me tell you this. You have a story with God. And you're not getting it wrong. There is a story throughout Scripture of what God is doing. And this, script, this story is shown multiple ways, with multiple imagery, with multiple themes, all telling the same story of God wanting to redeem man and live inside of him. This is our story. You can trust that story. Let me, let me give you a couple examples of this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Amen? We see that God created the waters that covered the sea. Later on, we hear about Noah with the water that again covered the sea with a new start in creation. We hear about Moses, whose birth, and, and in order to escape persecution, he was sent down the river. We see the story of the Exodus as God brought those in bondage out of bondage through what? The river. Brought them through the waters that he separated. In Psalm 77, Psalm 79, it talks about God rescues us from the deep. In Psalm 66, he talks about how the Lord's salvation came through the waters. Psalm 136, the Lord's mighty creative hand talks about how he created the waters again. And then we hear about salvation told in the story of Jonah, who was in the belly of the beast, just like we were, but was rescued from the belly in the midst of the ocean. And we see Jesus coming to the disciples walking on water. We see again, Jesus steals the storm in the water. And I believe the story culminates in John 7, 38. And he says, He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall come rivers of living water. You see, there's a story God is trying to give with imagery. There are storms all around us, but there's a true river that's coming. Okay, let me give you another example. As I see it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, and He said, let there be light. Let there be light. And the light shone in the darkness. Moses, when he was encountering the truth, came upon a burning bush. Eventually, Moses with the the people of God, and there was a tent of meeting where the fire came down. Elijah, in battling with the powers of the earth, baptized the altar in water, and then Jesus sent fire to consume it. Psalm 27, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation, in whom shall I fear? Malachi 4.2, and I, I love this. Corey just recently preached on Malachi chapter 4. Malachi 4.2, this is the promise of God. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. That's talking about us. About Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 4, it says, In Him was life, and the life was what? The light of men. And let me tell you where I think the story culminates once again. Matthew 5, 14. Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Eventually, we see ourselves in Revelation chapter 7 where he says, all the believers were clothed in white and shone forth gloriously. I believe the Lord is, is, there's a story all throughout Scripture. And when we drill down on a verse, we can lose the story. The original Scriptures weren't listed verse, 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 verse. The verses aren't even often separated by sentences. They put sentences in half and call it a verse, a half a sentence. And we leave like the subject and predicate and we see the verb and the object and we call it a full verse. We can't even get full sentences, let alone whole paragraphs, let alone the whole story God is trying to tell. So many people are confused thinking that Paul wrote some sort of systematic theology and sent one part to Galatia and one part to Corinth and one part to Ephesus. And that's not all what he was doing. Paul was telling the story of God's redemptive nature as each city needed it. Telling a different aspect, a different angle, a different viewpoint of what God is trying to do in the earth. And instead, we pull one verse and we say, this is the whole gospel. This is it. It has to go through this lens. And we lose the story of Jesus being sent to redeem creation and let God live on the inside of us through faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We lose the story and we, we get tempted to not trust the story any longer and think, Man, we get tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Oh, maybe my story isn't right. Maybe I've been in the wrong story. Maybe I need to run and be a part of that story. Maybe, maybe, oh, their story's better than my story. Their call's better than my call. Their testimony's better than my testimony. What God is speaking to them is better than what God is speaking to me. Let me get out of my story and try to get in their story. Then I'll be complete. You can trust your story. You can trust what God is doing in your life right now. You can trust what God is doing in your life right now. Now, come on, you can trust what he's doing in your life right now. I'm just convinced in this season, I'm preaching from where I'm at right now. Disappointment is at work in the church today to rob you of God's promise. Disappointment is a lie that tells you God is not at work in your story. Disappointment is a lie that says God is not at work in your story. He's in other people's stories, not in my story right now. He stopped my story and he went somebody else in somebody else's story. He has stopped. His work has ceased. I missed it. Somehow he has failed me. I'm disappointed because he's not at work in my life. And if you let that lie fester long enough, you will kill hope so you don't have to be disappointed again. You will find a way to not let hope live in your life because you know it's just a road, another road to disappointment. Come on, I'm preaching where I'm living. I'm telling you the truth. This is the truth of God. The devil does not want you to hope. You see, <clears throat> Hebrews says that our hope is anchored in the holy place beyond the veil. I believe that's purposeful language because what we hope in sometimes is unseen. And if you can see it, it doesn't take hope. I don't hope that Tracy's my wife. That's a bad marriage. <laughs> Amen. Amen takes no hope for that. I hope that my children will be serving the Lord in 20 years. I'm willing to put my faith at risk for that. I'm willing to put my emotions at risk in that. I have hope that in three years, my life will be better than it is right now. Too many people don't have that hope. And so they live in the funk that they're living in right now never hoping for better, therefore never trying to better their life. Boca Raton has no hope for a better future because they don't know that there's anything better than money. <clears throat> so how do we jumpstart this hope? How do we jumpstart our story? How do, we, how do we keep actively engaged in what God is doing in our life? Thankfulness. Thankfulness recognizes that God is still active in my story. 
Let me say it again. Thankfulness recognizes that God is still active in my story. Come on. Thankfulness recognizes that God is still active in my story. And I have found the more you focus on thankfulness, the more you get thankful about. The more you have to be thankful for. I have found the more you look for God active in your story, the more you see God active in your story. The more you start seeing Him in your life, the more you start seeing Him in your life. The more you look for disappointment, the more you find things to be disappointed about. And that is a road you do not want to travel down for long. I've been to the end of that road, Lillian. It's not a good road. You know where that road takes you to? Stop hoping. Resign yourself. Prepare yourself for failure. Learn how to prepare for failure. And so you start living failure so you can get there before you get dragged there. Faith says, faith says I'm going to start preparing myself for the promise before I get there. <laughs> Shaba. I got a short message. But it's, uh, I want to I ignite something tonight. Ha. Huh. We need to be thankful to protect our heart and to value what God has brought us. You see, mm, disappointment says what he's brought is not enough. I need more. Thankfulness says everything God has brought me is good and I have everything I need. I am fully content with you, God. This culture wants you to believe that what you have is not enough. And Jesus is your limitless supply. Somehow, this culture wants us to, us to believe that this river on the inside of us is not enough. And somehow, we need to go to somebody else and get somebody else's story so we can actually have the supply that they have. That's carnal. That is not God. That is not faith. It's not belief. It's a work of the devil. <clears throat> They're having a good time. I hope we start shouting soon. <clears throat> huh. Okay. I'm going to get a little spicy because it's Saturday night. I'm not an evangelical. I've said that before. That offends some people. I am evangelistic. I believe people need to get saved. I believe that Jesus died for everybody. I believe that God wants all to be saved. Not all are saved. Though all could be saved if they got smart. All right? They quit being stupid. <clears throat> Sin makes you stupid. Amen? Evangelical theology says that God will be at work in the future. This dispensational theology says that in this dispensation that we're in right now, we don't have all of God. But one day in the future, in the millennial reign, then we will have all of God. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. You can't have the Holy Ghost and think there's some other part of God you don't have. He, he, he's not breaking off his leg and not giving you his arm. Christ is not divided. We are the body and He is the head. Tell me what part we don't have access to. Is there a part of your body that blood can't get to? You know what happens? That part dies. And there is no death in the body of Christ. The work of God is not some future entity. The perfect time to be alive is right now. Right now. That's hard. That's hard. But there's nothing that Jesus ever said that said, I'm holding some of me back from you. But act like I gave you all of me and be happy like I gave you all of me, but I'm not really going to give you all of me. That's for some other people in the future. I just reject every theology that says I don't have everything that God has to offer right now. I could go through scripture with you, but I don't feel like it right now. Let me just say this. All the prophecies about peace and 
Swords being turned into plows and all that. None of that. None of that scripture says it's in the millennium. None of it. It's just a promise of God. Why not now? Why not now? Why not now? Disappointment says that I can't hope in God too much and maybe my family will get saved and maybe they won't. Faith says, as for me and my house, they shall serve the Lord. I hope I'm preaching your message, Paula. A little payback action right there. So the Lord has been rebuking my lack of faith recently, and I'm, and I'm thankful. I didn't like it originally. But as my heart began to get softened, I got appreciative. <clears throat> there is people that I have been praying for that I love dearly, and I have been praying that the Lord would deliver them from their circumstance. And now I'm like, well, why? Why can't we just have their circumstance changed? There's people who are in bad, let me say it this way. I want to be, I pray for you. Um, well, yeah. Hopefully it works a little bit. If not, I'm going to keep praying either way. I don't know anything else. <clears throat> not everybody in here has healthy families. It's true. And so sometimes unhealthy families create unhealthy people. There's some revelation for you right there. And so I pray at some point that you would get delivered from unhealthy families. But now I do that. But recently I'm like, well, why can't their family just get saved and become healthy? It takes the same amount of time to pray either one. So let's just pray that everybody get healthy. I have fam- faith for deliverance, but not in the whole family getting saved. Well, let's just go for the whole thing. And if God wants to do something lesser, that's fine. If he just wants to deliver you, that's fine. But let's just pray for the whole thing. Right? So let's stop, let's stop praying for the millennial reign. Let's pray for now. Let's just have it right now. And if you don't want to deliver, that's up to him. But I want it all right now. I want it all right now. I want him to reign over Boca Raton right now. I want the restoration of all things now. We lost in the fall. But everything I read in the scripture, the curse was broken. That's what, my, that's what the book says. The curse was broken. I want all the effects of the curse reversed now. Now. And so it's easy for me to look at what has not been restored and justify my disappointment. Or I can be thankful for what has been restored see him at work in my story and trust him that he's going to continue and complete the work which he has begun in my life. Amen? That takes effort, though. That takes effort. <clears throat> which takes us back to our scripture. Shall we go back to Luke? Is, was, was it Luke? Was our scripture in Luke? Yes, Luke. Look at that. Is this making sense, anybody? Yeah. Let's read our scripture one more time. Now, if you read it in the English Bible, they got all kind of separators in there that aren't in the Bible. So I would encourage you to start reading the Bible in a version that doesn't have any of that stuff. If you get distracted by it, there are Bibles that just, it's paragraphs, like it was written. Imagine, Lillian, if we read the Bible like it was written, instead of through the lens of some guy in the 1500s. Right, Revelation right there. All right, check this out. So Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, yes? He was passing between Samaria and Galilee. I don't have time to tell you the prophetic significance of that. Just know that it was significant. As he entered a village, right, there were these guys with leprosy, verse 12, verse 13. They raised their voices and they called on Jesus. Has anybody ever called on Jesus? Hallelujah. And Jesus saw them and he said, show yourselves to the priests. Didn't pray for them yet. Didn't lay hands on anybody. He told them, go to the priest. Now, you go to the priest to show them that you've been healed. Cried out to Jesus. Jesus spoke to them. What does it mean if you cry out to Jesus and Jesus speaks to you? You know what that means? He heard you. 
And he says, whatever you ask in my name, I shall do. Whatever you ask in my name shall be done. Jesus, heal me. Go show yourself to the priest. That means you're healed. Watch this now. Watch this. As they were going, okay, I've got to take a break right here for a second. As they were going, they were cleansed. Now, too many people are waiting for the evidence before they go anywhere. Oh, I just feel called to the lost. Well, I bet if you go, you'll get anointed. But they keep going to these conferences, waiting for somebody to tell them they're anointed. As, watch this, as they were going. Now, when you have leprosy, how many of you know you can't even go into the city of Jerusalem, let alone go to where the priests are at the temple? I need you to hear this. You can't go to the temple with leprosy. You can't go to the priests with leprosy. Jesus said, go to the priest. He was not trying to defile the law. He's saying, by the time you get there, you're going to be clean. So watch this. This is pretty good. Now, one of them, verse 15, saw that he'd been healed. He turned back, giving glor- glorifying God with a loud voice, fell on its face, blah, blah, blah. Verse 17. I mean, it was all important. I just don't feel like reading it. Verse 17 is just not important for this. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed, but the nine, where are they? Verse 18. Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? One was thankful. One was thankful. Now, in this, in this covenant that God had with man and through the law that was passed down through Moses, if you had leprosy, you were completely cut off. You weren't allowed in the city. You weren't allowed to touch your family. You were literally a castaway. You were completely cast away from society. Now, let's just think for a second what that might feel like. Have you ever had a breakup with someone you loved and you felt like you were dying? Have you ever lost a family member? Have you ever been told you're not allowed to be around your kids or your parents or your mom and dad or your aunts and uncles? You're not even allowed to be in your hometown. You're not allowed to come back to where your people called their homeland. You're not allowed to go to the temple. You're not allowed to celebrate your religion. You are cut off. Completely cut off. You think that might have some inner scarring. You think that might cause some emotional issues. And so Jesus prayed for 10 to be healed of their leprosy. And he told them to go to the priest. One was thankful. Watch this. Jesus says, were there not 10 cleansed, but the nine, where are they? Was no one found who... Return to give glory to God, except this foreigner. Verse 19, I need you to get this. I need you to get this. And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. If you look at the Greek here, it says made whole. God can move in your life and do something and you don't get the full, the full effect because you forgot to be thankful. You're looking for the next thing. You're not going back to God remembering what he did for you. You're not giving him thanks. You're not saying, Jesus, I just want to let you know that I recognize what you're doing in my story and I want to honor it and I don't want to forget it and I want to glorify you for it. Jesus says, you get the rest. You will be made whole because I want to stay connected to you through your story. All of them were blessed. One was made whole. Watch this. Watch this. Now, the Pharisees are questioning him. When is the kingdom coming? I need you to see this. Jesus just healed... Ten people. One recognized Jesus as God and maintained thankfulness. And then he says, Pharisees, you want to know when the kingdom's coming? 
It's not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is. Or there it is. For behold, the kingdom is in your midst. That, that Greek there is kind of in your midst. It's among you. It's in you. You're in the presence of it. He wasn't telling the Pharisees that they had the kingdom. He's telling them. If you're not looking, you're going to miss it. Now, it's the time of the Passover. They're expecting the Passover. Then the Passover lamb is going to come, and the Messiah is going to come and murder the Romans. And when, when is this kingdom coming? Jesus is like, no, 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 no. It's not going to look like that. It's not going to look like that. Watch this. You have to recognize the kingdom in your story. And you have to give Jesus thanks for what he has been doing. For there is the kingdom in your midst. You don't need another story. You don't need another testimony. You don't need something that somebody else has. You need to recognize the kingdom that is in your midst, in the midst of your testimony, in the midst of your breakthrough, in the midst of the miracle in your life. There is the kingdom of God. And if you will recognize it, it will continue to grow. Shabba. Shabba. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Shabba. Hey. Shabba. Shabba. And I feel like the Lord is reorienting some of, you, some of us. He's reorienting some of us. Because the enemy will send people to confuse you on what your story is. He will allow disappointment to rob you of the kingdom that's been released in your midst. Shakaba. I just feel right now in the name of Jesus, the Lord, man, I just I feel this yoke of manipulation that's being broken off of some of you right now. Because someone is jealous of your story and they want you to value their story over yours. I'm telling you, don't, don't get all look for the devil right now. I just feel like the blood of Jesus is setting people free right now. Amen. Setting people free right now. If I can accomplish anything tonight, we might get out of here early. What's up? If I can accomplish anything to you tonight, that sentence didn't make sense. If I can accomplish anything tonight in you, Ah, I want you to be thankful for what God is doing in your story, what he's doing in your testimony, what he's doing in your life, because that is the life of God in you. Mike, can you come on up for me? Shakaba. Come on, I need you right now. I need you just to be thankful right now. This is what we call the activation portion of the message. This is when I activate you to see the kingdom of God in your midst through thankfulness. In this season right now, God is reactivating something in this church. There is a first love that happened right at the beginning that's, that's being reactivated right now. I knew it was happening. We've been in a season of it. And tonight, I felt it. I felt it in the air. And then we started singing a song that we sang in the very beginning. I said, man, thank you, Lord, for confirming. Thank you for what you're doing right now. And God is going to begin moving in a significant way in the lives of the people. And we are going to begin exporting the kingdom of God in this area. We have enough, we have enough to share. I need you to press into God right now. I need you to just connect. Connect. I need you to, is this making sense, Mikey? Is this making sense? Is this making sense, Sam? Mm. Henry, is this making sense? Shakawa. And I just feel like some of us need to just allow ourselves to be vulnerable to disappointment. Because you can't be vulnerable. You can't choose hope or disappointment to be vulnerable to. You gotta let you, you gotta you gotta let yourself vulnerable to both. Your wristing is irritating me, Lillian. Shaka. Whoopsie. Come on. Just, just, get, just allow him right now to reactivate things in your heart. I just saw him. Re- ha, ha. 
I see him reactivating something in your mic. I see him reactivating something in you right now. I see like the, uh, mm. I see your pen not being passive but active. I see the Lord reactivating you in writing songs that reach people. I, I feel like the Lord is like, your songs have been good and you've been thankful and recognizing who he is. But I see you shifting in this season. Songs that get released on people that activate them in worship and activate them in faith and activate them in hope. Does that, does that make sense? I see they've been good, but they kind of went from here to there, which is good. But I see him turning them again. But I see him do that in the house right now. I'm going to say this and then we're going to pray. For years, we used to do uh, communion on Easter Sunday. And then one day I said, now, sun, Easter Sunday is when we, when it, like, that's when we have more unbelievers than ever. Why would we do something only for believers when we're inviting the most unbelievers? It doesn't make any sense. We want you to come to church so you can be excluded from what we're about to do. So we either need to say Easter Sunday is only for believers or like, let's have a service for the people we're inviting, right? Like that just... That just kind of makes sense. Just kind of makes sense. And I just see us purposefully doing, I just see this coming upon people right now, this anointing to purposefully reach people. Purposefully expand the kingdom. So let's do this now. Let's just begin to pray. Let's pray in the Holy Ghost. And I feel like the Lord is going to begin reactivating hope in people's lives right now. Can we do that? Let's begin to pray right now. Right now. I just feel the anointing in the room for this right now. Pray in the... Shakaba sambangante de de de. Shekan te de beke taraba le bar remonta te de beke. Come on. Shabe lamba rebo ko taraba. Sheba. Come on. Come on. Come on. I need you to go after this. Do what you need to do to go after this right now. Do what you need to do to go after this right now. Come on, go after it because I feel like there's, a, there's an opportunity. There's an open heaven right now to let this be dealt with once and for all. Come on, go after it right now. Shamba kanterebeke. Come on, disappointment comes off in the name of Jesus. We will be the one that comes back with thankfulness and be fully whole in the name of Jesus. Shekantebeke. I just feel like disappointment and failure has, has sidetracked some people's story when God was walking you through something in that. That was always supposed to be part of the story. God was teaching you something in the disappointment. Don't stop praying in the Holy Ghost. That God, God was teaching you something. Like we talked about a couple weeks ago. How Jesus had to grow through the things that he suffered. And some of us, there's no other way to grow then through suffering, but we allowed disappointment to come and sidetrack what God was trying to do. It gave us another story so that we can try to understand the story of God better, but we are understanding it through a false lens. I hope that makes sense to you. The devil came and said, listen, here's how you need to be viewing this season. God has failed you. God has left you. God has stopped writing your story and it was a lie from the pit of hell. God was taking you through something and the devil didn't want you to get through it. He wanted you to park there for a while. Thankfulness will carry you through this suffering. Thankfulness will carry you through what seems like a dry place, but God is really there with you all along, even though you couldn't feel it. Come on. I feel like I'm talking to somebody right now other than just myself. I'm telling you, I'm preaching from where I'm living. Come on. I've just seen too many people coming to breakthrough in this season and recognize the lie of the devil and it coming off their life. And I want to bring you with us. I dare you to start hoping, hoping again. Sheba, no, keep it going. Come on. Turn them up just a touch there if you would. Come on. I feel I need y'all to feel this. I need you to start playing in the spirit. I need you to release faith right now. 
Shekaba. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on, there's something happening in the room right now. I see it. I see it happening. Father, to release your angels right now in the name of Jesus. Here's what I want you to do. If you, if you, let me ask you this question. If you knew you would have to go through all this to follow God, would you still do it? Don't answer yet. I want you to think about that. Because this is what we're signing up for. Before you could say, I didn't know. Now you know. Would you still choose Jesus? Is he enough? Is he enough? I'm not selling you a bill of goods that say now if you have faith, hard times aren't coming. It's not what we're doing here. We're preaching the real gospel. We follow the God who went to the cross. And he said, pick up your cross and follow me. Now you know what that cross looks like in your life. Will you still follow? Close your eyes and I need you to just make it, make it, just, just get at peace with what this means in your life. I'll tell you, then you become more than an overcomer through Christ Jesus. Would you still... Would you still? Would you again? Will you die to self? Will you die to your plans? Will you die to your comfort? Is he enough? Is he enough? Or do we need the fame? Do we need the fortune? Do we need the popularity? Do we need the power? Do we need the stuff? Do we need the comfort? Or is he enough? I feel like this is the gospel. You know, a lot of good churches down here. You go to one of them, they'll tell you, no, you're not going to have any hard times. Is it in that church? You didn't do anything wrong. The Lord was in your story still. Father, in the name of Jesus. We love you tonight. Who can say amen to that? And we declare everything you do is good. And we have decided to follow you. Tell them in your own words right now. I have decided to follow you, Jesus. I'm under no illusions of what this will look like. I choose to follow. I choose to declare that you are good. I choose to come back and give you thanks. I need my discipleship group to come forward. I feel like it's time for a fire tunnel. That's good. Yeah, no, that's good news. If you're pregnant, you can sit down if you want.